Elizabeth Elliot is a woman of heroic faith. In fact, she became a great friend as a result of these interviews. She and her husband, Jim, had a vision for reaching a tribe in Ecuador. Jim went and was stabbed to death, speared to death by this tribe. Later on, Elizabeth went back to that tribe and led two of those warriors who murdered her husband to faith in Jesus Christ. If you're looking for encouragement, the kind of faith that'll put fuel in your tank, this story is a gripping story that could change your life. This week on Family Life Today, we are commemorating events that took place 50 years ago, events that shook a nation. Here's Elizabeth Elliot. One day in October of 1955, Nate Saint flew into our station to tell us that he had discovered some Alka houses. Within a very short time, Ed McCulley, that politician from Wisconsin, Jim Elliott from Oregon, and Nate Saint instituted a program of dropping gifts to those Indians with the hope that they would be able to break down their hostility and prepare the way for an attempt to reach them. You can imagine our excitement, our trembling, the prayers that went up. And on the evening in January of 1956, just before these men left to go in to the edge of Alka territory, by this time they had been joined by Roger Udarian and Pete Fleming, they sang together that hymn, We Rest on Thee, Our Shield and Our Defender. A week later, they were all speared to death. Welcome to Family Life Today. Thanks for joining us on the Wednesday edition, Wednesday, January 4th. Our host is the president of Family Life, Dennis Rainey. I'm Bob Lapine. This Sunday, January 8th, commemorates the 50th anniversary of the martyrdom of those missionaries in rural Ecuador. And I don't know, do you remember where you were the first time you heard the story of those five missionaries? Bob, I was uh, almost eight years old in southwest Missouri, and I do not recall hearing about it as a little boy. It did make the news. It was in it did. Life magazine and other periodicals, but you didn't hear about it till later in life. I heard about it finally in college, and uh, uh, it was through reading Elizabeth Elliot's book, Through the Gates of Splendor. And for me as a college student, to get that book and have it be such a page turner. I have just given my life to Christ. And I think what made it compelling reading for me as a, a collegian was that I was 20 years old. I was looking at life with uh, eyes that were alive to the spiritual work of God in, in human beings' lives. And, and I'd freshly given my life to Christ and his lordship of all the areas of my life. And so here's uh, a couple, Jim and Elizabeth Elliot who uh, had given their lives to Christ and his lordship, and Jim Elliot gave his life, mm -hmm. literally was martyred for his faith. And then Elizabeth, his wife, went into that tribe after he had been murdered by them to love them, speak with them, learn their language and customs, and ultimately share her faith in the gospel and his forgiveness with them. That book that you mentioned, Through Gates of Splendor, is a book that God has used over the years in remarkable ways to not only tell the story, but to uh, talk about what it really means to live with Christ as Lord. And I think it's probably stirred the hearts of a number of people who have ended up involved in world missions in some foreign field, carrying on the legacy of Jim Elliott and Nate Saint and the others who were uh, who were killed on the beach on January 8th, 1956. And I'm glad, Bob, There's there's now been a a full-length feature movie that has been made called The End of the Spear that's going to be released here in a couple of weeks. It's a great movie. You and I have seen it together. And personally, I think what's going to happen as this film comes out is the very thing we've been talking about here. I think there's going to be a generation of young people who see this story and who all of a sudden start evaluating their faith. Now, I think adults are going to do the same, but I think there's going to be a generation of young people in youth groups, in junior high, high school, and college, and they're going to evaluate what they're living for and who they're living for. And as a result, I think we're going to see a fresh crop of missionaries 
head to the world. At least that's my prayer Mm -hmm. as this film comes out. You were in the audience in Kansas City in 1983 when Elizabeth Elliot addressed a crowd of students who had assembled there for an event that Campus Crusade was sponsoring called KC83. And she talked about those five young men who were all in their 20s. They were at the beginning of their adult life. And uh, they had headed off to the field. She described their lives. And I think what she did was she painted a picture so that everyone in the audience could go, that could be me. And uh, we we wanted our listeners to hear how she described the lives of, of those five men who were martyred that day 50 years ago this week. Once upon a time before you were born, there were in Ecuador a tribe of so-called savages. Not very much was known about these people. They were naked. They used stone tools and they killed strangers. Nobody had ever gone into their territory and come out alive. Missionaries had been praying that God would enable them someday to take the gospel to these Alcas, but it had never happened. And it wasn't until 1956 that the first Operation Alca was attempted. Five young American men banded together to do this I want to tell you a little about who they were and how they got there. First, there was Nate Saint from Philadelphia, one of the founders of the Missionary Aviation Fellowship. He inaugurated the program of jungle flying in the eastern jungle of Ecuador. Pilots who have watched film footage of some of Nate's landings on those canyons of green trees in the jungle have said that it's impossible. Nate was a genius. He was a rather slightly built blonde guy with a terrific sense of humor, a creative imagination, and an almost fanatical discipline and caution as a flyer. Then there was Roger Udarian, a cowboy from Montana. He went into World War II as a, ca- as a paratrooper, was wounded, and somehow he ended up in the eastern jungle of Ecuador working with the Hibados those Indians that you've heard of who used to shrink people's heads and put them up on poles around their houses or wear them on their belts. Really nice guys. The next man was Pete Fleming from Seattle, Washington, an earnest scholarly type who had a master's degree in literature and planned on an academic career. God had another plan for Pete, and Pete ended up in the jungle of Ecuador, working with the Quechua Indians reducing their language to writing, and beginning the rudiments of Bible translation. Ed McCulley was a guy that I knew in college. And when I think back, there's hardly anybody who seemed less likely to me to become a missionary than Ed McCulley. He was handsome. Good looks can open a lot of, a lot of doors, but I don't think they'll get you very far on the mission field. Doesn't it seem like kind of a waste? I mean, here was this guy, six feet three, football player, track star, president of his class, and when the Hearst newspaper chain sponsored a nationwide oratorical contest, there were 20,000 entrants. Just picture everybody that's at KC83 entering that oratorical contest. Ed McCulley won first place. He was smooth. We thought he'd make a great politician. That's what he was going to be. He had charisma. And he went to law school, but God changed his mind after he got into law school and somehow he too ended up in some godforsaken corner of the eastern jungle of Ecuador, again a missionary to the Quechuas. Why would a guy like that bury himself in the jungle? Couldn't he find more fruitful ways to use his gifts, all those talents that God had given him? Wasn't that an awful waste? Well, yes it was. If what matters to you is self-image, fame, money, success, terrible waste. The backwoods isn't really a very auspicious place to pursue those kinds of things. Then there was the fifth man, one I got to know pretty well. His name was Jim Elliott. We're going to hear more from that message at uh, KC83 in just a few minutes. But of course, Jim Elliott, the one that Elizabeth got to know, was her husband for a little more than two years. 
Um, he had been president of his class at Wheaton College. He was from Portland, Oregon. And she tells the story of her romance and her marriage to Jim Elliott in her book, Passion and Purity, which has been read by hundreds of thousands uh, of people. But these five men, Jim and Roger and Pete and Ed and Nate, they are heroes, don't you think? They are. And uh, when Elizabeth Elliot uh, spoke in KC83, which was a a gathering of, of college students from all across the country, it was spitting snow outside, but it was warm inside. It was a huge, cavernous, almost like a warehouse. But they had set up this convention with Elizabeth Elliot uh, speaking to these collegians, and uh, she shared how these young men gave their lives for their faith. You don't just decide one Tuesday morning that you're going to be a hero of the faith. There has to be a period, a long period, maybe years, of learning to walk humbly in obedience with God. You put one foot in front of the other, one step at a time, one day at a time, year after year, beginning now. Is it worth it? One day in October of 1955, Nate Saint flew into our station to tell us that he had discovered some Alka houses. Within a very short time, Ed McCulley, that politician from Wisconsin, Jim Elliott from Oregon, and Nate Saint instituted a program of dropping gifts to those Indians with the hope that they would be able to break down their hostility and prepare the way for an attempt to reach them. You can imagine our excitement, our trembling, the prayers that went up. And on the evening in January of 1956, just before these men left to go in to the edge of Alka territory, by this time they had been joined by Roger Uderian and Pete Fleming, they sang together that hymn, We Rest on Thee, Our Shield and Our Defender. A week later, they were all speared to death. The Wodani are killing so many people. The government's under pressure. They're going to bring in troops. We have one chance to reach these people. Now, this is it. When a life is taken, we call it a tragedy. If the Wodani attack, will you use your guns? When a life is freely given, a sacrifice. Why? Two of the men who killed them are friends of mine now. Their names are Minkayi and Gikita. And they made tapes for me telling me everything about what had happened that afternoon on the beach. And they said they thought the men were cannibals. Then Kiwi and the young woman that was there at the friendly contact. And then Kiwi wanted to marry her. Napa really didn't want that to happen. When they found them coming back from the friendly encounter, the tribe flew into a rage. They wanted to kill Nankiwi. Nampa certainly did. Gakita saw this. Minkayani saw this. Dewey saw this. And they redirected the anger, which is something about their culture. You get angry, you're out of control. The way you affirm control is to kill. So they redirected their anger toward the missionaries. And that was ultimately why they attacked and killed the five men. Why would God allow a thing like that to happen? He was their shield, their defender, and he let them get speared to death. What had happened? Can your faith cope with a set of facts like this? There is a mystery here, but it is not unprecedented. Go back to Hebrews 11, and following all those wonderful triumphant accounts, we read, and others were tortured. They faced jeers and flogging, fetters and prison bars. They were stoned. They were, listen to this, sawn in two. Talk about endurance. Is it worth it? Is it worth it? How many things can you think of that are worth suffering for? There is nothing 
worth living for unless it's worth dying for. Have you made up your mind? The world was stunned when the news of the death of the five men hit the headlines. People did not know that there were still Stone Age savages around. I suppose that's one of the reasons they were impressed. And very few people realized that there could still be ordinary young men for whom obedience to Jesus Christ was quite literally a matter of life or death. There was plenty of editorializing about it. The secular press called them blankety-blank fools. The Christian press did a lot of very glib explaining of why God would allow a thing like this to happen. The verse that brought assurance to me was 1 John 2.17, the world and all its passionate desires will one day disappear, but the man who is following the will of God is part of the permanent and cannot die. Well, as Elizabeth was retelling the story of uh, the death of those missionaries, we included some of the the soundtrack that comes from the movie End of the Spear that's being released. I think it's two weeks from Friday that uh, the movie is going to be released. And that movie portrays the events of 1956 and actually takes you back before 1956 to tell uh, about the Wadani tribe and then brings it up to date. It brings you to the point where Steve Saint, one of the children of those martyred missionaries, uh, goes back and makes contact with the tribe and finds out how the the spearing took place, why it took place, and actually finds out who it was that killed his father. And uh, that man becomes his friend. That man's now a Christian. Mm. Um, it's, it's a powerful story. Steve Saint ended up uh, going back to live among that tribe as well. Uh, frankly, Bob, you and I have interviewed a lot of folks where you, you just kind of felt like, you know, I just, I, I felt unworthy. I, um, I've given my life to uh, following Christ in, in 35 years of vocational ministry. But uh, you meet somebody like that who, who left the comfort of living on the East Coast and uh, taking his family and going back into the jungles of Ecuador and, and living with the tribe and, as you said, befriending the man who ended up murdering his, his father. It's just a remarkable story of faith. And one of the things we've done is, is we've put together from a number of sources some of the descriptions about Jim Elliott uh, by his wife, Elizabeth, and his faith. And we thought you'd enjoy hearing this uh, montage of audio clips as Elizabeth Elliott describes the man who gave his life for Christ. And our intent here is not to single out one of the five missionaries, but because of her writing and speaking, we probably know more about Jim than we do the other four. But again, all five of them are heroic and courageous. I want to tell you a little bit about that missionary, Jim Elliott. I knew him when he was a college student. He had made up his mind that he wanted two degrees, a Bachelor of Arts, which the college was qualified to confer, and an AUG, which the college was not qualified to confer. The one he wanted most was AUG, approved unto God. He got that out of the Apostle Paul's letter to Timothy, and he had made up his mind what he wanted to live for. Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured a cross, making light of its disgrace, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. He made himself nothing. Jim Elliot wrote in his diary when he was 22, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. Were those men really out of their tree to do what they did? In Hebrews 12 it says, what of ourselves? With all these witnesses surrounding us like a cloud, we must throw off every encumbrance 
every sin to which we cling and run with resolution the race for which we are entered, our eyes fixed on Jesus, on whom faith depends from start to finish. Jim Elliott was a man with tremendous gifts, a man who could undoubtedly have been of great success in probably quite a few different professions, a man whose friends and relatives thought he was crazy to go burying himself in some godforsaken corner of the jungle just to talk to a few ignorant Indians when he had such a powerful testimony and a great, quote, ministry in this country among young people. But Jim's life was not his own. The verse that he wrote in my yearbook was 2 Timothy 2.4. A soldier on active service does not entangle himself in civilian affairs. He must be wholly at his commanding officer's disposal. Jim was disposable. And here is the crux of the matter. And by the way, did you know that the word crux means cross? Did you know that the word crucial comes from the same root? Until the will and the affections are brought under the authority of Christ, we have not begun to understand, let alone to accept, his lordship. God is saying, I have something infinitely better for you than you can imagine. Will you trust me? Will you wait? Will you obey me? Lord, I give up all my own plans and purposes, all my own desires and hopes and accept thy will for my life. I give myself, my life, my all, utterly to thee, to be thine forever. Fill me with thy Holy Spirit. Use me as thou wilt. Send me where thou wilt. Work out thy whole will in my life, at any cost, now and forever. What do you live for? Once again, that's Elizabeth Elliot uh, reflecting on her husband, Jim, who, along with four other men, was martyred in uh, 1956, 50 years ago this week. And uh, we felt like it was important for listeners to uh, hear that story again, maybe some for the first time. There are probably some folks who, who have been unaware of this story and will want to get either a copy of Elizabeth's book, the one that you read when you were uh, in college through Gates of Splendor, or the DVD of the documentary that is called Beyond the Gates of Splendor. We have both the book and the DVD in our Family Life Resource Center. And the easiest way for listeners to become acquainted with all that took place uh, in those events is to get the book and get the DVD. You can go to our website, familylife.com. Click where it says Today's Broadcast right in the center of your screen, and that should take you to a page where you can get more information about these resources. And if you order both the book and the DVD, we'll send you at no additional charge the CD audio that features the excerpts we've been listening to this week from Elizabeth Elliott. Again, our website is familylife.com. Click the button in the middle of the screen that says Today's Resources and go there to find out more about the documentary Beyond the Gates of Splendor about the book Through Gates of Splendor. And there's a link on our website as well that will give you more information about the movie that's coming out in a couple of weeks called End of the Spear. You can watch a trailer for that movie, get more information about the release of it. I think it is January 20th that it's going to be in theaters, and and we hope families will attend uh, that movie, End of the Spear. 1-800-FL-TODAY, where again the website is familylife.com. And once again, Dennis, I want to say thank you. I know you do as well to uh, those folks who uh, pitched in at year end and made a contribution uh, to us here at Family Life. We heard from many of our listeners, and I know our team is still going through and trying to open up some of the mail that we received so that we can issue a formal thank you note to those of you who contributed at year end to Family Life today. We really do appreciate it your generosity, and I think it is safe to say at this point that we were successfully able to meet the match and take full advantage of the $350,000 match that we had in December. So thanks to all of you who pitched in. Uh, We appreciate you standing with us and appreciate your ongoing support of this ministry. Thanks for helping keep us on the air here in this city and in cities all across the country. 
Tomorrow, we have a special guest joining us. He is the son of one of the men who was martyred as a missionary 50 years ago this week. Steve Saint is going to be with us, along with the man who helped make the movie that tells the story of Steve's dad's martyrdom, the movie End of the Spear. Mark Green is going to be here as well. And we have a surprise guest who's going to be here with them. And we hope you can be back with us. I want to thank our engineer today, Keith Lynch, our entire broadcast production team. On behalf of our host, Dennis Rainey, I'm Bob Lapine. We will see you next time for another edition of Family Life Today. Family Life Today is a production of Family Life of Little Rock, Arkansas, a ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ.